We are joined tonight by Bradley Bulmer, or Brad as we call him, Shelley, Ruth, Stan, and of course Buddy. Buddy's happy because he's had his sausage, so he's not going to interrupt <laughs> us too much. But um, he's fed, he's watered, he's going to be good. He's going to be good. So asleep, come on man. in, say hello. Is he asleep now? Is he? He's asleep. Dan, I have that effect on so many people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just start talking and people go, you should see Brad in some of our meetings, right? We actually have a screenshot of Brad and he's here like this in the chair. <laughs> so we do. Don't we, Brad? And you've got the cheek. You've got the cheek when I fall asleep at his meetings to get on me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, let's start. Emma, um, we're recording this for everybody who can't join us live and we emailed the link and all that good stuff. And it'll be in the 3XM Insiders group tomorrow. So I don't know where to start. I suppose a good place is to start at the beginning, right? Because your business, Stan Plus Stan 2, is third generation, right? Brad is third generation. Stan, you are second generation. Um, and when yeah. Shelly married you, she joined the business. And Ruth is Brad's better half, much better half. And, um, and of course, it was Brad's granddad and Stan's dad who started the business originally. Is that right, Stan? Or did you join? Uh, start it together? You start it together. Yeah, we started it together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my my dad was a a press photographer. That's really how I got into uh, into business. Um, so so my dad was a press photographer, and uh, uh, that were it. I had no interest in photography, and then I ended up in a poor job, and that were it. That was me epiphany. Um, <laughs> that was me. My dad was me. My dad was uh, was me escape hatch, I suppose. Yeah. So that's how I got into photography. Um, Very good. And Shelley, when did you jo when did you join this dynamic team? Um, Bradley was about six years old, um, and I'd been working full time and a couple of days in the business, and then we decided really to stop working where I were previously and come into about so about twenty one years ago. I can't believe that. Uh, wow, yeah, that, just nice and steady. That time flew, right? That? Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, Ruth, when did you meet Ruth? When did you meet this renegade, Brad? Uh, ten years ago this year, actually, we met. Um, didn't start working here straight away because we were at college, um, and then I went to uni. And was brought in part time initially when I started uni, and then realised that this is what I want to do. So after uni finished, I came on board full time, and now they can't get rid of me. <laughs> Not that we would want to. No. And Mr. Bradley, talk to us. When did you join the business? Um, I think I was nineteen. I just finished college. Uh, I've done. Three years at college, which is different to if there's any Americans here. So um, our college is kind of like your high school at the end of it. So you're supposed to leave at 18. Um, but I did an extra year and left at 19. Um, didn't really want to go to university, so I asked my dad for a job. Um, I thought I'd be at the studio for a year. <laughs> I'd take a year off. Uh, you know, fast forward like eight years, I'm still here. Very good. Very good. Very good. And um, you guys, you know, you run an amazing business, you know, um, and what I love to see. And, you know, for, for those of us who for those of you watching who don't know what Brad does. So Brad uh, works in the family business, mainly on the financials and on the marketing side of things. And um, then Shelley and Ruth do a lot of the sales piece and then Stan is the main photographer. Is that pretty much the breakdown? Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. So I know because Brad is a BSA mentor, right? So Brad does work for, for BSA as well, where he's a mentor to photographers around the world to help them implement the marketing that he does in your business that has you on the road to becoming a seven figure studio. Right. So what I want to talk about, first of all, is sort of, there's sort of three legs to the stool, right? To create a successful business. There's the marketing and sales piece. There's the operational piece and there's the financial piece. So I'm hoping we'll be able to talk a little bit about those three legs 
um, as to, you know, the key takeaways that you can share with people to say, you know, if you really want to create a sustainable, profitable business and get to six or seven figures, like you guys are going for those seven figures, you know, what do you need to do? What are the key takeaways? So because Brad is used to me asking him questions, I'll start with him, right? Because uh, you guys know all your roles, right? So I'm going to ask you some, some questions around each of your roles. So Brad, talk to us, first of all, about the marketing side, right? So if you were to give three takeaways to people here tonight, right, on the marketing required to create a business that, that is going to be a seven-figure turnover business in this wonderful in industry of ours, what would they be? Um, well, I think the first thing is you need a plan. But in fact, no. Plan's the second thing. First thing is you need to know your numbers. <laughs> so first thing is you need to know your numbers. Because you can't make a plan without, uh, without knowing your financials, which I know we said we're going to talk about later on, but it's kind of all, all of these things kind of feed into one another. So, so you have to know your numbers. Um, so key KPIs, so what revenue you want to generate. You know, for us, being seven figures, million pounds sterling. Oh, just lost my parents. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be back in <laughs> in a moment. But um, so it, it's breaking that down based on our average order, based on how many sessions we need in uh, a year, a month, a week to be able to get that, um, uh, to understand that, and then build a plan centered around that. Um, and then it's how to deliver on those targets. And then I suppose the third thing is, is you have to be in control of your marketing. You can't want to build a profitable six figure, seven figure business if you're not in control of marketing. You know, it's the number one most important thing uh, to do in any business, not just a photography studio, which you know a lot of photographers don't like to hear. Um, you know, it's probably marketing, sales, operations, financials, and then taking pictures. <laughs> it's right at the bottom, which, you know, it isn't nice to say because I know a lot of photographers um, don't really like accepting that, uh, but, but it's the case. Um, so, yeah. You so, get... so can we so, deep dive into, can we deep dive into taking control of your marketing, right? As to what that actually means, right? Because let's just go back in time a little bit, right? Before you started to take control of your marketing, what was marketing like then? All right, so like it's kind of like pre, but it's different because I suppose our studio always had a little bit, uh, a little bit of control of the marketing. It just changed when I got into the business. So we went through a weird transition period, like in the late two, when I say late two thousands, like two thousand eight, when the financial crash happened. Um, we had a drop in business. Groupon came around. We relied heavily, heavily on Groupon. Um, essentially, it was a free marketing source. Um, so uh, that essentially filled our studio. So we would go live on Groupon with sell 300 vouchers. That was as done for a quarter. Uh, it was lazy. Uh, we relied a lot on third party. Um, and then essentially pretty much overnight, uh, Groupon didn't want to do anything live again, didn't want to feature us, didn't want to do anything. Uh, they kind of saturated the market with, um, with photography offerings. Uh, so that got pulled. So then really quickly, um, I had to find a way of how to get that work back in. Um, uh, so it, it, I went through digital marketing. It was through Facebook. At the time, since I started the business, we were running ads like 2013, 2014. So I've been running ads on Facebook, like not from the beginning, but, but really, really early on to the point where like you could re pretty much only run page like campaigns or post engagement campaigns. There were no options for conversions or traffic or any of the kind of fun stuff you've got now. Um, but it, it, we just did more of that and built a plan around that. Um, and it worked. And, you know, just doubling down on it. Okay, so let me try and summarize this in a couple of words, right? So you know your financials, you know your sales, you know how many um, sessions you want to do. So, and then from that, then you know how many sales sessions you need so you know how many leads your marketing needs to generate to have a conversation, to turn into a booking, to turn into a sale. Yep. And once you know that, then that's half the battle in terms of the planning piece. Because a lot of people do the planning and don't do the implementation, right, Brad? But you're a real implementer as well. Your whole business is. So um, is there anything you want to add to that before we talk about operations and sales? 
Um, just what, what you kind of let into a bit there is that you have to take action. Um, and especially in those early days on Facebook, you know, we're, we're from Yorkshire, but my dad's a Yorkshireman through and through. He, he did not like spending money on marketing. He does not like spending money full stop. Um, okay. So a lot of the times in those early adverts, it, it was my own money I was putting up. And if the advert went great, then awesome. I told my dad he'd pay me back. If it failed, which at that time was common because I had no idea what I was doing, uh, I wouldn't tell him. But I, I knew that we had to market. We, I knew that we had to invest. Uh, I went to find a way. So, so I just did it. And by taking control of that marketing, you have a full view of the calendar, right? Um, or the diary, depending on which part of the world our listeners are in. And um, you can then, you know, turn on and off your marketing as you need. You're not relying on Groupon or someone else to fill your calendar or diary, right? Yeah, it, it's consistent. Uh, and that's what our months and years have been for, for you know, a long time now. It's just, it's just consistent. So we used to be really, really busy in December, pretty quiet in the first quarter and like third quarters. But now that's all changes. You know, it's, it's just steady. We're, we're quieter when we're not in because, you know, we... We go on holiday together and up until last year, we all lived together. Uh, so when we were in the business, the business wasn't operating. You know, it's very much still an owner operated business. So hold on for a second there. You're saying something really important there that many may not have heard. So let's just rewind, right? So what you're telling me is that you've taken seasonality out of your business. Is that correct? Yes. No, I don't believe you. <laughs> 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 no, tell me about it. <laughs> but yeah, we essentially have. Um, uh, it's really funny. I'm, I'm a dad, my dad can say this is when you look back at our older accounts, uh, which we have because my dad's a hoarder, very much like me. If you look at the, all the shit I've got behind me, um, we keep everything. Yeah, I've, bought you all that. <laughs> well, I've bought some of it myself. <laughs> no, um, so you can look back at our accounts, and you know, our, our Decembers were. Well, like the biggest months ever, November and December, really, really big, great months. And then the rest of the year, really, really quiet, like less than a quarter. Um, but th th that's just been taken out now. Uh, and the key to that is just marketing. You know, it's, it's not like some like magical hocusy pocusy thing. It's just consistent marketing. Excellent. Excellent. So let's just talk about the... Um sales side next so i'm going to go to shelly for the sales side so shelly you know you guys have worked really hard i know you have over the last 18 to 24 months right to increase that average sales value right and um, and change how you go about your sales and stuff can you just share with us just you know some of the key things you've had to implement to get your average sale to the to where it is now We've streamlined what our products are, so our artwork and our books and our reveal boxes, and just kept it as simple as possible and had the higher quality of, of products. So we don't do packs or packages or USBs or discs or anything like that. We just do wall out books and reveal boxes we just keep it really simple okay so just to deep dive into that so you're telling me on the wall in the uh, design room or, or viewing room or sales room wherever you call it that um you've got 300 corners uh, of frame right so that you can offer your client you know one of 300 different colors and shades and sizes right no, 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 nothing like that. No, not anymore. We used to. We no. used to. Yeah, really. It's so confusing for that customer. That customer has to make lots and lots of decisions and choices in that design room. And the simpler and plainer you can make it for them, the easier it's going to be, the easier it is that they're going to spend more money. Believe it or so, not. So... So for your albums then, right, and your folio boxes, surely you have six different color of boxes from 3XM and a swatch book of 54 letters for the album covers, no? No, no. no. The, the client buys what they see. So if they see displayed what you want to sell them, that's what they buy. 
And to be honest, Ronan, I know you do lots and lots of different coloured yeah. boxes and everything, yeah. but we've never, ever done it. We've only ever done two colours of the wood ones because the, those wood reveal boxes are a piece of art on their own. So we do the black one and we do the walnut one. That's the only two boxes to see. That's the only two boxes we sell. That's the only two boxes the customer wants because they can't see anything else. Um, so I know you do lots of other different colours, but we've just never gone there. It's just too complicated. Okay, so I've got you now. Let me just summarise that I've got this right. So, um, so what you're saying to me is if you give your client too much choice, they end up not buying at all because they're confused and don't know what to do, yeah, what to buy. They're very confused, yeah. They've, they've picked the photographs. They know they want the reveal box or the album or the wall art. And that's as simple as you want to make it. If you keep then asking them, do you want it in a, a different colour? Well, yeah. what colour? Well, you can have any colour. You can have pink or blue or, and then they do well is it a pink that we like or is it the right color red or you're just giving them too many options that uh, making them confused and then they start to rethink about what they're ordering and do they really want it and then you could lose the sale from it okay i've got you i've got you um oh stan has left the building um the phone rang the phone has just gone i'm so sorry no, that's okay. But I thought that you don't allow Stan answer the phone anymore. That's what I was told. No, 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 no. It was too quick. <laughs> Excellent. All it was right. Too quick for us. So we'll come back to the sales again in a moment. So Ruth, just talk to me then. Um, on this journey, right? On this journey that you've been on in the business, what's been the biggest sort of aha moment you've had? It's, it's mindset. Going, going back to what Shelley said about too many choices, when all these things are put in front of the client and they have to pick and choose and take something away and it becomes a very logical decision, whereas we're trying to make things emotional. We're trying to make sure, obviously, always that they've had a fantastic experience. That's always been the case. But now that we need to be a bit more emotional, we need to be we need to open up a little bit more so that they feel comfortable opening up with us and then it means more. It's it's an emotional decision then. So Stan, all the clients buy because you're such a great artist, right? Yeah, I think they do, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think that's what it is. Yeah. And, it's, and also, it's, you know, the personality and whatever, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> so, because um, Stan, you know, you've been... Um, you're, you're similar to myself, I think. We've been around a little while. So we've seen a lot in our industry, right? We're certainly around longer than, than, than Ruth and Brad. So, you know, we've seen this um, a lot in our industry about, you know, I'm an artist, look at the awards I've won. Surely you're going to pick me, right? Um, and we've, we've both been there, right? But I know your business doesn't have that attitude, right? That you're totally focused on the client, right? So much so that every time you do a session, you get a briefing document, Stan, about what images need to be taken, right? So talk to me about that transition. Was that a difficult move to make from being totally client-focused than, and I know you've always been client-focused to a degree, but you've even brought to the next level, right? To be client-focused to the degree that everyone's story is different and you're creating images that reflect those individual stories as distinct from I'm the artist, I know how best to pose you and how to do, you know, take these images. Talk to me about that journey. Uh, it's easier now, to be honest, now that we've got a, a schedule to work to. Uh, we, uh, and it's easy to shoot because obviously you're shooting now for the client rather than creating pictures that you want to create. So okay, okay, okay. Stop, uh, stop, 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 stop. That's really important. We need to get this again, right? So give me that again. <clears throat> so we're we're shooting. Go again with that piece. We're shooting to. Well, we're shooting for the client. We're shooting the images that they want. And photographs, yeah. I've got some photographs, yeah. I can't see images. So and 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 that's why it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier from my point of view. 
um, that I've got a schedule and I can work to that. I mean, you'd have a schedule before that, but it's easier because then you're creating images what they really want to purchase. So, Brad, talk to me about this, right? Because th this is um, a lot of photographers haven't come to your position as a business, right? With this focus on the client, it's not about me as the artist, it's about creating an experience and capturing images or photographs that reflect their relationships, right? And um, was that a big job? Because you're not a photographer, Brad, right? No. You've come in with business and marketing and the financial piece. So was that a difficult transition for the business? Um, not really, because we've always kind of um, been on that path. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose we talk about epiphanies, one of my earliest epiphanies or marketing epiphany was that customers don't really want eight six mounts or um or even framed photographs you know the amount of people that wake up in the morning thinking you know what i want a family portrait uh it is few and far between and frankly i think those people would be quite weird anyway <laughs> uh they have other problems and it was that problem solving in marketing that we talk about a lot in bsa but how to write ad copy and advertise to people that have problems that we need to solve that aren't photographic related, but are. So it's about you know them building confidence or feeling empowered or celebrating their connection with their family or their partner or whatever it is. That's the problem we're solving. So we had that, you know, 2016 running adverts to solve problems. That was just a natural progression away from you know the focus being on us as photographers to us as being kind of serving clients. And then obviously through um so sort of working with Steve, that's just kind of accelerated that to that next level. Okay, so you better just explain to everybody who doesn't know who, who's Steve. <laughs> so, so Steve is Steve Saparito. Uh, he's a photography mentor based over in Melbourne, in Australia. So he's, uh, he's a real superstar. Um, the, the only man that told me my business was shit. <laughs> when, it's all shit. It's all shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it's actually the for dog shit. <laughs> when, but when in reality, it wasn't, you know, it was a you know multiple six-figure business with healthy profit and cash in the bank, it, you know, that paid us all a good wage. But uh, but no, because, you know, he, he, he was, he had bigger vision um, and he was right. So that, that kind of took us on this more client-centered, client-focused business that was real kind of um, frustrated me to begin with because it's everything that, I wanted and our values and everything we wanted to do, you know, he just um, could kind of piece everything together. I was lacking that ability to piece it together. But you so know, it's, it's, it's why you need mentorship. You know, it's why you need help. So Ruth, you talked a moment about a moment ago about mindset, right? And that was the big epiphany and change for you. Um, was that mindset change about a focus on the client more or was it more about was it more about you know having self-belief each of you in the business that you could achieve this seven-figure business and these higher averages it uh, going back again it wasn't so much the client focus side because that's my favorite thing about working here that it always has been very client focused that Stan's not the kind of photographer that wants to enter a million awards a year and wants to be the best photographer around he is a fantastic photographer and he doesn't need that validation from awards um so it has always been about the client i think it's it definitely self belief and more so that not only we can get to that point but that we're allowed to talk more to our clients that we're allowed to get them to open up and we're allowed to give ourselves permission to open up and we we say once you come through the doors you're part of the stand plus stand two family and I genuinely believe that I like I love being able to catch up with clients and I love seeing Stan see daughters of people whose weddings he took photos of in the 80s and he know he, know. he remember the he remembers the wedding he remembers where they got married and specific and it's amazing to see and you just see the client like know that he's taken an interest in their life it's it's amazing to see so so um Shelley just to talk about the business mix right so 
you you're primarily boudoir, but you don't just do boudoir, right? No, no, we do pets and newborns and bump shoots and families as well. Okay, so talk to me then, M. Stan. What what's your favourite client? Is it the boudoir or the pets or the family, or do you have a favourite type of client? No, no, I'm a favourite. You like yeah. the dog. You love oh, it. I mean, you I, love I, a dog. I, mean, I, mean, I, love the dog. I love shooting. Yeah, yeah. I love shooting dogs. Yeah. Um, because they're so predictable, yeah, and quirky and funny. But yeah, I, I suppose dogs, yeah. Um, apart from Molly's dog, our makeup artist, we did her family and she's got a, what's she got? Bulldog. She's got a bulldog, and it, bulldog. and it destroyed studio. But, <laughs> uh, apart from Molly's dog, yeah, dogs are fine. Yeah? Um, so, yeah. Oh, There's Buddy. Buddy is making an appearance. Hello, Buddy. You woke up. <laughs> dogs. Hello. Hello. <laughs> He's just woke up from yeah. an <laughs> just woke up. Come on, get down. Come on then. There you go. So so Shelly, can we talk about the sales piece again, right? For another moment. So yeah. um talk to me about this idea of after you do the session, right? You do instant viewing of the images, right? Mm -hmm. Um because yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of photographers think that if I don't bring the client back another day to do the viewing, that, um, you know, that art and greatness takes time. Yeah. So I, I can't do a viewing on the day because if I do, you know, I'm not going to have all the images retouched and, you know, put my style on them and all that sort of stuff. Just talk to us about how you've managed to make that switch to instant viewing, what it means to your clients, right? Because it obviously reduces friction, right? They don't have to come back a second time, right? And um, so it obviously does that for them. But how do you deal with that, 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 that principle of, you know, surely I can't do an instant viewing and show my clients images that were finished half an hour ago, that the session finished half an hour ago? Yeah, yeah. We, we did used to, shoot and they used to come back a week after to view and we thought that were okay but um from doing the instant viewing the change in the client and in us is immense it takes the pressure off that will they won't they purchase because you're in more control of that so the you, we spoke to them on the phone numerous times they come in we do a walkthrough we show them the artwork they have the hair and the makeup done. They do, we do the boudoir. Before we do the boudoir, we walk them through again, looking at the artwork. They then instantly then have a cup of tea and then we go into the design consultation room. They are buzzing. They are wanting to look yeah. at the work. They're so excited. Why would you send an excited person away to wait a week to come back to look at the photographs to pick what, what they're falling in love with. When you're showing them this artwork and you've talked to them on the phone, they've already positioned that at home. They know where they're going to put it. So just to carry on that excitement and show them their photographs in that artwork layout, wow, they want it. Of course they want it. I want it. You want to keep that excitement and that momentum going. So... Why we used to do that before, I do not know. We but, COVID. Yeah, we yeah. COVID, COVID helped we because COVID of the restrictions. We had to keep that customer here and do that. But we don't, why would you tell your customer that they have to be retouched and polished up and look fabulous? That's like telling them that they're, they're not fabulous, that <laughs> they need touching up. And, and, and it's not like that at all. We show the clients the raw image. We show them how they are. And, and, you know, as a woman myself, I don't want to see a photograph touched up. I might want to pick some editing afterwards, but not really. I wouldn't want anybody blitzing my photograph and choosing how they thought I should look. I think that's a really personal a, thing. Very personal, Retouching yeah. Retouching is a very personal, a personal thing yeah. that you might have a scar that is seen as an imperfection by someone else, but means an awful lot to you. Yeah. And to see that then removed is is a blow, really. Yeah. So even when we didn't do instant viewings, we never retouched. No, we didn't. No, never. The yeah. clients have always seen the raw, the raw file. 
and they're super excited to see that as well. It's it's great. So Stan, does that put a whole load more pressure on you as the photographer to get it, you know, as perfect as possible in camera? Well, shooting, yeah, shooting boudoir, everything's in camera anyway. We just, we well, just crop in camera. Uh, we just keep a control at lighting, um, and no, it don't, not really. No, it's just uh, if if you've shot film, I mean, I, I shot I shot film for years, and when you shot film, you had to get it perfect. You had to do it perfect. You had to crop in camera. You had to make sure your exposure is correct. So, so no, it and not really. It, it, it's. It's, it's, it's improved our business hell of a lot. Yeah, we have practiced though, Rose. Well, yeah, we have. It's we just not a simple yeah. case of, you know, Stan is a, a professional, well-qualified photographer and he knows what he's doing, but still we have practiced the shots that we know yeah, work, yeah. that so, we know are going to sell, and we've got that down off to a fine art. So we've worked really hard on that, you know, in COVID and, and before. We were in here in the studio practicing yeah, on a cell. Oh, we had a great uh, lockdown. Yeah, yeah, on, on, yeah. The, on the dog, you know, yeah. just making sure those, those, you know, the lighting and the body positioning or the, the family group, whatever, we knew we got it, got it in. Yeah, we, so we knew we got, you know, the ones that worked. Well, we, ba we basically practiced a full shoot in Boudoir. Yeah, yeah. We did, yeah. We so full Boudoir, shoot. family dog, we know yeah. what works. And obviously then... If you know what works, you just tailor it a little bit further to that client's personal choice after you've spoken to them. And that's so much easier, so much easier. Okay. And, you know, Shelley, you're the, you're the face of the brand, right? In terms of the marketing, because I see your videos everywhere and you're in the video and I see your emails <laughs> and you're signing off the emails. Fault. That's Bradley's fault, yeah. And, yeah. and I heard, I heard <laughs> something... <laughs> I heard something recently, recently, Shelley, that you were walking down the road and someone stopped and said, oh, you're the famous Shelley Fulmer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because no. you're all over social media and everything. <laughs> so, 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 Shelley. I did, a, honestly. Yeah, go on. A couple of things that you've said to me there. So the first thing is that... Um, you know, you're doing the instant viewing, the client's excited. So after the session, you're able to, they're able to come in into the design consultation room. You design up their wall art. You offer them either a folio box or an album of the rest of the images. They make their investment then, and they don't have to come back again until all the, the, the products are produced, right? Yeah, yeah. You see, yeah. as a non-photographer, right, for me, like we work really hard in our business to reduce what we call friction, you know, reduce the friction for the clients, make it as easy as you possibly can for the client. And by doing that, it actually adds value and perception of quality, which means they will pay more. The client will pay more rather than the mindset, which is, oh, no, there's no way I can show them an image or images out of the camera without I doing all my retouching. And they, if they come back a second time, they're going to create have more value, put more value on the work and are going to spend more on the work. And that comes back to the mindset, I think that Ruth talked about a little bit earlier. You've all talked about it, but this mindset that that's the mindset where you think you're the hero and your client is not, right? That just, you're the yeah, artist. Yeah. I think the big thing is that realistically, 95% of people probably have never had a professional photograph. So they don't they're not looking at the things that a professional photographer is looking at or someone that does your retouching or, or that kind of thing they're looking at a, a boudoir and knowing how much work they've just put in and how confident they look and they're coming for a family and they're just seeing time with their family they're not seeing the spot on the kid's nose and they're not seeing the scratch on dad's leg or whatever the case may be they're not looking at those things that that's something that we do it as as people that are obviously critiquing it more, but that's obviously afterwards, we can pick up on those things and get them away if they want them to. But while, while ever you're retouching, you're drawing attention to what's missing. Okay, that so, yes, it does. And it means that you're also then, if you look at it from an operations point of view, you're only doing post-production on, on the images or photos you sell, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Wow. Okay. So there's a couple of questions in here, right? Jerry has a question. So do you offer instant viewing only for boudoir or on family portraits and pets? Is, are, are all different um, ideal client avatars treated the same way? Are they all instant viewing? Wherever we can, we will always do an instant viewing. Uh, in some cases, particularly if you've got a newborn and we've had them in for a couple of hours. Five kids. Yeah. Or five kids like we had in yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, the parents have just about had enough because we've wound those children up, we've got them excited and they're bouncing around the studio. So to calm them back down again to look at the photographs, mum's probably not in a good state at that particular point. So you, you've got to gauge it for each individual uh, portrait session. We, so, we yeah. So, so for all boudoir have, have come back and for most no, sessions that... No, so boudoir is instant viewing, all boudoir is. And for most of the sessions, wherever we can get them in, that day we will, or the next day. We don't leave it a week or anything like that. Wherever we, you know, as soon as we can get them in, we do. All righty. And Melissa asked then, can you explain how exactly you do an instant viewing? How many people are involved? Question mark. Right, so if it's a boudoir, we always try and get the partner to come, even if it just comes after she's had the photographs done or during, or she, they might want to come on their own. So they'll have had hair and makeup, they'll have done the experience. Then as, as I'm helping the client pack away her clothes, yeah, and chatting about the experience and how she enjoyed it, we can't wait to look at the photographs, stands with the way. Mm. stands with the way with the camera loading those cameras up uh, photographs up on the computer doing a quick edit on them you know taking the ones that it, it, it chooses in and out uh, by the time I've brought the client up and we've got a cup of tea ready for her stands done those photographs I whiz them down into the DC room do a quick uh, mix up of the photographs how I like how I like them looking do a quick design of some artwork for her, the one that she's mentioned, the one that she's looked at that we spoke about before. So I'm picking the right artwork for her, put the photographs in, bring her down, and that's it. So that we've got that, we've had to work on that though, Ronan. That's just not been over, an overnight thing. So we've we've worked on that and got that down to 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. It's that. Yeah. It's that. Yeah. But it didn't used to be that. It used to be like half an hour. Mm -hmm. And Stan's, Stan used to be very snap happy, I like to call it. So <laughs> particularly in boudoir, you might take 300 photos. So to then, the clients never saw that many, even when they were coming back. But now the necessity is that they're seeing them straight away. So Stan's more precise in, and obviously doing it more and more and practicing doesn't take as many photographs, doesn't it take as many shots, so he can cut them down quicker. So it's just a couple of each set so that he knows that he's got the right expression and her eyes are open and the lighting's right. And we only show the client 30 to 40 photographs now, whereas before we would show them 60, 60 to 70. 70. Yeah, which is just too much for the client to look at. They can't make the right decisions because there's just too many choices. So we've, we've worked a lot on that to get that where it is today. And am I correct in saying that you, you wouldn't show, um, you know, two images that are similar to the client and say, which one do you prefer? Which one do you not like? No. Look no. at the head. The head no. is nodding. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, we, we, we show the photographs to the client, yeah, on a slideshow. So they see them one by one. And then we've told them beforehand they're going to do that. Once that's finished, we're going to sit down, look at them individually, and I'm nodding, and pick out the ones that you love. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Excellent. And so then so, we look at them individually. And you're projecting, right? You're projecting big. Yeah. 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 Was there always that case, or is that a change? Were you, did you ever show on a big No, no, TV we've always projected. Always yeah, projected. We've, we've always projected, but now we've, it's on the ceiling. And we, I used to sit with a little desk, but now I sit with a client. So we sit side by side. 
when COVID rules allow, <laughs> uh, sit side by side. So there's more intimacy between me and them. You know, I'm not behind them. I'm not at a desk. I'm not, you know, I'm part of that viewing. I'm part of what they're experiencing and it makes it more involved. Okay, so, so the first um, investment we're looking for the client to make is artwork for the wall, is that correct? Yeah, well, just depending on when you've spoken to the client beforehand, we always obviously choose artwork for the wall, but some really specifically say they want a book or they want a collection. Um, so some really do particularly want a book or a collection and not, not anything for the wall, but nine times out of 10, that's, that's what we're looking at. So what's the difference between a book and a collection? A collection is the folio box. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Your, your, your folio box. Your, your folio okay. box, yeah. Okay, okay. And like, I, would have thought, like <laughs> I would have thought that um, a boudoir client would always want a book, an album, right? No, no, not necessarily. No, but yes, because there's, there's that many photographs that they love. It's really hard if you pick that wall out for them and they're looking at that wall out and they love that. They've already pictured where it's going to go in the home, in the bedroom or where, whatever. Then to not have the rest of the photographs that they love is really hard. So then it's easy then to put the rest in the book or the, the um, folio box. box. Okay. And, and if you have 10 clients true, do you know how many would go for the album over the over the folio box? Or do you have any idea? Bradley know that. Oh, Bradley know that. <laughs> really, they would go for the folio box rather than the book. Yeah. The yeah. beauty with the folio box is that you can frame the photographs. You can check them so out. then if they yeah. do choose to have something on the wall that's not a big 50 inch piece, they can um they can frame single single pieces really. Okay. Okay. So Brad's gonna Brad, Brad's a numbers man, he's gone to check the numbers. Look at that. I can see him on his computer. So another question Jerry has then says, um, so the software you use, do you use ProSelect? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what if a client wants to view the images online? Do you ever do that or do you? No. The never, 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 never. Who would like to do? <laughs> In all fairness, being the one that sets up the technology side of things, I've never even looked into how to do it. Really? Which, so when we do tell our clients, no, we don't have the capabilities for online viewing, we're being honest. We did one or two in COVID, though, didn't we? We did one yeah. Zoom viewing. One, yeah. one in COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a special circumstance. Yeah. So we did we did one, one, and it was a previous client. So we, we did one, you did one yeah. Zoom viewing, didn't yeah. you? Right. And Nick has a great question and I'm going to half answer it and then I let you guys finish it off because, um, but you guys do the wall art different than a lot of photographers. A lot of photographers go to sell one big piece, right? But that's not your approach. Yes, there's a big set of artwork on the wall, but it's not one piece. Can you just talk to that for a moment? We did used to do um, the photograph, the mount and the frame. But then we had all the chevrons of the different colour frames and then the customer had to pick all the frames and they were trying to match it up with everything in the, in the living room. And again, that's another decision that they have to go through. So we streamlined everything and did the, the canvas one. So we do the canvas that you can do. Four, yeah. The, the main four, aren't they? The collection. So yeah. they're sing we do single pieces of canvases that are displayed together. But obviously they're able to be displayed apart if if the client so wishes. And we do a couple that are big pieces that are single pieces with with foot with more than one photograph on. So we've gone from frames to canvases. We still do a frame, but the canvas you can put anywhere. Doesn't matter what colour wall it is, doesn't matter what colour your furniture is, you're not matching it up to anything, makes it much more simpler. And then because of the design of it, it's very modern, it will fit in any home but they look super, super cool. It's artwork. When we, we say artwork, we mean it looks like artwork, not just a photograph on the wall. 
because they're like panels, the long panels, then a square, and then another panel. So you put four separate photographs in there and put it together as one display, and they look absolutely gorgeous, stupendous. And that one display tells a story, right? So it can function on its yeah. own, each individual piece, or together it tells a story. Yeah, particularly for boudoir, because it's not just about a one photograph of your body. It's about the intimate things about yourself. You know, you could have a tattoo here or, or, or your boobs or your legs or, or something like that, that you can put little photographs together that just make that person, that their Paint personality come to life. Yeah, ab about that one person without it getting down to one photograph. That's very difficult. Out of 30 to 40 photographs, you're asking the client to get it down to one photograph for the wall. That's very hard. And I think you've told us that, you know, that initial wall collection, you even make that easier for the client that you present to them the images that might be in that wall collection as a starting point, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've had a chat to them where they're going to put it, you know, where would they like to display their artwork in the home and if it's boudoir more than likely it's, it's it's the bedroom if it's family it's in the home we get them to describe where they're going to put it is it above your bed how big is your bedroom what else is on the wall how big is your couch have you got a two-seated couch three-seated couch so you know where where just going to turn it off, where where they're going to put it and then when when they've come into the studio as well, you've took you've took them you've took them round and you've showed them the really sorry about that, getting really distracted. That's all right. so, so you come into the studio, you've already sussed out the size of the portrait or, or the, the layout that they're going to be interested in. You show it them, you say, this is what we talked about on the phone, this is what I think is going to look really nice in your bedroom, so they can see it, they're nodding, they agree. We're still talking about that down in the boudoir room. This photo is going to look great. I can just imagine that on your artwork in your bedroom. Da 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 da. da. I go downstairs. I put those photographs in that artwork that she's seen, and then she comes downstairs and looks at it. So they're my choice to initially. Nine times out of ten, they usually go with that. But because um, again, it's very difficult to pick your photographs. So we try and make it as easy as possible. The easier it is, the simpler it is, the more comfortable they are. And that's what Excellent. we want. So, Brad, we have a whole load of questions, and, and, and Shelley and Ruth and Stan, um, and I'm sure there's one for you too, buddy. It's coming, I promise. Um, so, <laughs> it's it's asleep. Asleep. It's asleep. It's asleep. <laughs> See, I told you, puppy, to sleep all the time. Um, so let's see with the first one. Brad, I was waiting for how long it would take. So how do you deal with digital images, right? and the desire of today's clients to want to be able to share some images on social media? I mean, we, we give anybody, whatever anybody purchases, we'll give them the, the low res files. We'll call them social media files. Um, so they've got access to them to share. I mean, realistically, they might be able to print like a six four after or an eight by six to, to an okay. Not really. Person. But, but like, I, I don't care. Uh, they they want to show the friends anyway. Um, I, I don't particularly care. We, we'll give them them anyway. If they want them for um, for high res, if they want them to print off or use in promotions or work, anything like that, then yeah, we can sell them. Uh, it's not something that we have in like a product guide or we really mention to clients, but you know, we can do that as an additional. And we get very few people asking for high res really? because like Bradley said, most of them, just want to share it with their friends. They want it as their phone background. They want to share it on Facebook. That's that's the reason people buy digital images, uh, I've found anyway. We don't get many that ask for it. We don't get many now that ask for a USB. Maybe maybe one every two months, I think, now, isn't it? We don't get many, that, do we? No, we don't get yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you give them what they want, sell them what they need. That they want digital files, uh, we, don't, we don't want them to print from them. Don't want them in what you know. Like a lot of photographers think they want them from, from like stealing copyright or anything like that. Clients have no idea about copyright law anyway. They, they, they have no idea they're breaching anything. They just want them on their phone and show their friends and family. Um, yeah, but they they need wall art. You know, they need to see these photographs all the time because if not, they'll put them on a USB and it'll be in a drawer and they'll never look at them again. Bad. 
exactly. and that's like the opposite of what we want to achieve. So um, I don't know who's going to take this one, but the question from Peter is what size canvases do you use? So you better explain them in terms of collections of images, right? Big ones. We do the we do the Steve Saparito graphic collections. From Oxley. From, but we, <laughs> we now get them from Oxley rather than graphic. Yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, they that's a set of collections that Steve so, yeah. Steve designed so basically. One canvas is a as a 16 by 16, and the other is a 34 inch long by 16 pan panoramic, and you get two of those and two square ones. So it'll go a 16 inch square. A 34 inch long panoramic, a 16 inch square, and another 34 inch panoramic. And you can put them how how you want to, whichever way you want yeah. them. And then, but we do a 60 inch space, don't we? Is yeah, no, we do a 60 inch by 40. Yeah, right? so that has five photographs on it. So you can have it tall or you can have it long. And we do a 40 inch that's, square. That's really popular, that's really good. We yeah. Do a 40 inch square. Then we do a 50 pano and three. 16 by 16. 16 by 16 squares underneath it and then um, we do a big 40 inch square that's either one image or well it's usually four four photographs that come one, one big one three small ones so it's the same layout as the big panoramic with three three squares but it's one piece yeah excellent and william yes the answer is yes so they have a very um, distinct worked out sales process where they're anchoring the investment with the client before a camera is ever lifted. And so all that anchoring goes on on the telephone and the conversations with the clients. In this case of Boudoir, not only the conversation that they have with the woman who's coming in for the Boudoir session, but with her partner. If it's family, they talk to each member of the family once it's not the younger children, you know, about the individual relationships and what's important to them. And that those conversations is what creates the, the, um, the list of images that Stan has to, ha, has, has to create. And each of those can be unique depending on the client's story. So hopefully we've answered your question there. Um, do you ever, do, so, um, Nick wants to know, do you ever do a 40 by 60 inch single canvas? Yeah. No, yeah. Do the 40, do the 40, we do. We we didn't know that was no. the big big sample. We we yeah. ordered a sample of that once, and it it was it was just too big. It was just too we do too like big. a forty by forty. We do forty by forty. Like yeah. a forty by forty, yeah. A single piece. We have we have single pieces available, but we just advertised the collections more. Yeah. I suppose is the better way to put that. The collections have really worked really well. Whether it be boudoir, family, or dogs. a dogs, they just work so well. Gives the client flexibility of displaying something really prominent in the home uh, with more photographs other than just one. And the important thing here about a collection, because some people think a collection is a package, right? It's not. Yeah, a collection no, is a no, series no, of no. images no. that are on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. And then all the other amazing images that they love will go into a 3XM folio box or an album. <laughs> we hope so, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. Brad, is, is uh, Brad, did you manage to crunch any numbers or? Yeah, no, uh, so it's on the last 11, uh, five are books, six are boxes. Right, so roughly a 50-50 split or thereabouts. And, yeah. it's, um, and they're both priced at the same, right? So there's no yeah. decision around price. It's around what the client prefers. Excellent. And, and Ruth, from a production point of view, is it easier to do the production for a folio box or an album? Well, now that you've started fully loaded again, wow, Ronan, it's yeah. very, very easy to do a folio box. Okay. okay the, so... To be honest, we use Loxley for our albums and the, their software and their system is also very easy to use. So they're both, they're both as simple as, as the other. Very good. And Rob, um, Rob wants to know, Brad, he says, so he's figured it out, right? So Stan is the photographer, Shelley is sales, Ruth is technician, but you also do some sales, right? Right, Ruth? And production. A bit of everything, yeah, and photography yeah. as well, yeah. Oh, okay. All of them. But he wants to know, what the hell does Brad do? 
<laughs> Not a lot. It's, it's in that bedroom. <laughs> he has a whip and he <laughs> uses it quite regularly. Yeah, does, yeah. <laughs> we also, is he coming in today? Oh. <laughs> is he coming in today? We oh, hear your stop. car pulling in the back yeah, and yeah. everyone just oh, goes, oh. <laughs> So Brad, you better tell Phil Rob in a little bit. Maybe he he didn't he wasn't here at the very beginning. So what what do you actually do, Brad? Um, so I, I do all the kind of I don't know working on the business stuff. So marketing, operations, finance, um, kind of vision planning stuff. Uh, I suppose when you're like a small owner operator business, you have to take on multiple roles. Um, so I've always driven the business forward in you know what the business is going to do planning wise and its main big vision. And then delivering on that. So I, I do all the marketing. Uh, I'm in the studio, so I, I lead all our team meetings and you know, make sure the team's <laughs> on task. <laughs> they hate being called the team. <laughs> they all hate me for calling them the team. The family. So I, I, I make sure the family are, um, you know, we're all focused and, you know, we're all doing what we want to do um, is, is the important thing and that we're all happy doing that and that we're delivering to our clients. All right, so we have a question on pricing now. I was wondering when that would come and what, you know, we could talk about four hours on pricing, couldn't we, Brad? And so yeah. <laughs> any tips on pricing? How much is the initial shoot, question mark? Okay, so so first one's really easy. How much is the initial shoot? Uh, three to a hundred pounds, depending on <laughs> what volume I want in. Uh, so th th that that's the easy one. And like, I can talk about this really, really in depth and we do talk about it in... Um, Jay's just said I'm the Minister of Propaganda. <laughs> I quite like that. <laughs> um, I see a t-shirt with that on, Brad. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, free to £100. I could talk hours about why, but generally with Facebook adverts, which is a, 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 any form of digital marketing, you want a smaller ask. Um, so that ask being under £100. And then from free to £100 depends on what volume I want in, how successful are the adverts working. Uh, essentially, it's like a, a hairdresser's or any high-end hair salon. Uh, depending on uh, if, if seats are empty, they're going to charge less. If seats are full, they're going to charge more. Same thing. Uh, our end product price does not change, but what offers are, are how we get that initial conversation does. And that's a key thing because a lot of people don't get this bit, Brad. You know, the difference between marketing and sales you know, marketing, the function of marketing and the offer and your marketing is to earn a conversation. And yep, yes, 100%. I use the word earn a conversation. You do not, you're not entitled for a client to talk to you. You have to earn that right. Yeah. Um, and what, what they pay for that, whether it's a direct offer or whether it's a register to win or whatever that might be, that has no end results on what the client's going to spend, right? That's the sales process. Yeah. Yeah, the, the two completely distinct uh, systems in your business. And essentially, you're not going to build a business on session fees. You know, you're not going to build a successful, profitable business on, on high session fees. You're going to do it on high sales um, in the back end. Uh, and that's what we focus on. You know, the two distinct things. I, I run marketing to have conversations with people who are interested in having one of our photographic experiences. You know, we then phone them, we have conversations with them. We get them booked in and then the minute they're booked in, it's part of that, you know, product delivery and sales process. So, Brad, I don't know if you've got an answer to this one because it's not your area of photography, but um, I do more of fine art, surreal manipulations, but I've been having a hard time finding the right clients. How would I find them, find them good folks? Um, so, I mean... You've probably got a few steps in that. So the first thing is you have to actually know who your ideal client is to have like an avatar built around them. Um, and it's more than just, you know, age, gender, ethnicity, where they work. It's more than that. That's important. But at the same time, you have to know what problem you're solving that client. So, so what does your, your fine art photography, what problem does that help your client solve? And then when you know that problem, you're going to have to write ad copy. I mean, I mean, the easiest way is to run adverts. And, and you know, if you need help join, running adverts, then you can join BSA and, uh, and me and Ronan can help you out with that. Um, but essentially, it's writing then ad copy 
to speak to that client, speak to that ideal avatar, to get them interested in what you do, to get them to click on an advert, to fill out a form on a landing page, for then you to have a conversation with them. Um, but before you can do any of that, you need to know exactly what problem you're solving. You know, or not, it might not be a problem, but what desire you're helping somebody achieve. So, so there's two things. It's either uh, people buy things because they have a problem and they want to fix it, or, or they have a desire to earn something or want something, and you're helping them get that desire. So our marketing does the same, and we flip-flop between the two uh, because, you know, not everyone has a problem, not everybody has a desire. So you need to write ad copy to appeal to both. So just to fill in the blanks, because this is a 3XM webinar, right? So those of you who are clients for us for some time, you know, we always help with the educational side. That's the function of these webinars, as well as all the other content we create. But during lockdown, we launched Business Success Academy. And Business Success Academy is designed to help photographers master the business of photography. And Brad joined us as a BSA mentor. So he actually helps photographers with this marketing piece. And we've got Janine in Tampa, Florida. And we've Jonathan and myself in BSA as well as all of the team in 3XM um, helping us with that stuff too. So if you ever want help with your marketing, join BSA, come in, do the, um, get the 30 day free trial, do the 14 day challenge, get your first funnel live. And we have a wonderful community. We have about 265 photographers now in BSA from around the world, which is wonderful too. And then of course, as importantly, you've got to have the right products. And Shelley and, and, and Ruth and um, Stan talked about that this evening. You know, if you're going to get that averages that you desire multiplied by the quantity you need to create a seven-figure business, your products have to align with that. Your products have to align with every part of the process. And, you know, the 3XM folio box is the ultimate folio box in the world. So check us out. Get to be honest, Ronan, we don't sell anything that we wouldn't put up in our house. Houses now, because we have a zone. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> we don't, we wouldn't, Yay. we wouldn't want to sell anything. Why, why would we want to sell somebody something that we wouldn't be proud to show off kind of thing? So there you go, guys. Not my words. But thank you so <laughs> much to you all for joining, especially Buddy. Um, I didn't get a question for Buddy in the end. I forgot that. <laughs> Still fast asleep. I, I forgot to ask him what's his favorite sausage, but you know, oh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it Frankfurter or is it, or is it, you know, oh, he likes the ones from Marks and Spencer's. Mar oh, <laughs> he's, <hot. laughs> he, he's got expensive taste, expensive taste. Marks yeah. and Spencer's sausages. All right. Listen, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We learned so much from you all. And um, thank you for sharing. You know, you've all big hearts, you like helping other people. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you for joining us in the webinar. And do you know what? I'm really looking forward to it because I believe you guys are coming to Imaging, right? In the USA in January. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so we're going to have fun at Imaging um, and, and, and we'll have a few pints and a bit of crack and whatever else is going. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking cry. forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you okay. so much for your business. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. We'll see you all again soon. Bye from all of us. Bye. Bye. Bye.